spaces, including Hilbert spaces, Banach spaces are, are and most recently, the expansions of the so-called Gabor expansions were um, relevant for the discussion of so-called frames. Frames, in a way, are just what generating systems are in linear algebra. But when you go to infinite dimensional spaces, there are unstable generating systems. And frames are just stable. Uh, I hope to come to the Kernel theorem where you would say, well, the kernel theorem in linear algebra courses is just the fact that you can represent every linear mapping on Rn by matrix. And so uh, you are just have to know what the, the operator is doing on and you store this in a matrix configuration. Physicists use this example very often to create kernel theorems uh, by saying, well, the deltas are a continuous basis. So we know a continuous function by knowing all the values, which means all the delta x of f, which are the function values. But it's a kind of dangerous uh, territory to work with this concept if you want to express continuous orthogonality or so. But this is what theoretical physics physicists are using and without uh, any problems, so to say. We also know that uh, for engineers and physicists, Dirac impulses, Dirac combs, and other objects are quite important. And that Laura Schwartz was giving us the right correctly with these tempered distributions. If you look at engineering books, you find very often some hints that mathematicians know how to fix uh, uh, kind of mystic, uh, mystic uh, problems or mystic symbols. Uh, but then they are using uh, integrals like the ones that I'm showing you. The integral over the complex exponential function is giving the Dirac delta. And you might say, well, it's quite plausible. Uh, you just integrate if s equals, uh, pardon, t equals zero, integrate constant one, so it's plus infinity. If you have an oscillatory exponential function, the integral will be zero. So yes, this is the definition of the Dirac delta function. But then, of course, the question is, why is it not three times Dirac or five times Dirac or so? So this is a very dangerous thing. It is not unreasonable, but in other talks, I compared it with the concept of one over pi squared, which is Hans. a very useful Hans. symbol, but not, use, uh, not, not a number. Yes, please. Uh, we, we, still, we still don't see your screen. Is it okay? Oh, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry okay. to tell you. I sound very good, very good. Sorry, I was, uh, I had it already and I thought you have it in front of you. No. Is it okay now? Is it see visible now? Yes, I can oh. see just, just this thing on the right side also. You can remove it. This oh, then, 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 I, then I have the wrong screen. Not me. Is it now without the right the bar, Alexei? No. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I see uh, screen with new abstract short version. Rostov on Don. No, no. Okay, no, no. So I'm very sorry, but uh, you should see a formula with a Dirac impulse. But uh, you know, I, I got yes, some yes. message. That's what got I see. Got a message that the connection is not good. So, do you see it now? I see screen which, with the text, technically speaking, engineers work with direct impulses. Yes, direct. okay, this is, yes. this is the right one. And no yes, side and this, this thing on the right side of the screen, you can remove it, this. Yeah, yeah, of course, no, no, it's, now it should be okay. Oh, okay. So, uh, what, 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 Alpha and triple of the form Schwartz, temper, uh, Schwartz uh, rapidly decreasing functions, L2 Hilbert space in the middle, and temper distributions. 
but I'm using a space called S0. Other people call it the modulation space M1. That's just another symbol. Okay, let's see. because it is a Banach space, actually a Banach algebra, both with respect to convolution and pointwise multiplication, which is densely embedded into L2 and which contains, which is contained in a weak star dense sense in. Sorry, I don't see your screen. You okay, I have to go back, but I'm not sure. Thank you for giving me the hint because it I was sharing it and it is not shared. Oh no. No, it is shared. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So as a definition, think of a Banach space of test function, therefore Banach. Uh, the Hilbert space in the middle and the dual space to the outside. So it's in a way similar to Sobolev spaces of positive order, C order zero, and many more spaces like this. Uh, it's also named M1 in the book of Charlie Grechenik, for example, uh, and the dual space is correspondingly M infinity. Uh, I want to mention that this is relevant or came up in uh, its usefulness came up in Garber analysis and time frequency analysis, but I will make that very short and just want to show you the pictures. I hope you can see now the pictures. Now I will explain what these symbols are. The blue symbol is a symbol for L1. Uh, the yellow symbol, the most beautiful is the circle is just L2. And what you can see here is clearly there are these blue guys which stick out of L1. So there are L1 functions which are not L2. And there are also, of course, L2 functions which are not L1. And the green box is L infinity. Now, what is the Fourier transform doing? It's rotating everything by 90 degree. So the blue box turns into a red box and that the red box is inside the green box just says you can estimate the supernorm of a Fourier transform by the L1 norm of the original function. So you can go on and make many, many more other things. And what I want to tell you is that I will concentrate it on the circles in this, this kind of the most simple objects here. You have uh, the, or the circle in between, which was the yellow circle originally in the previous one, the big circle, which is a zero prime, and the small circle, which is describing the, the round object just surrounding the short space. So you can have a kind of the smallest Banach space containing the short space in some sense, uh, which is a rotation invariant. That, that's the idea. So in uh, going back from the complicated uh, diagram, I would like to say, well, in the short setting, you have the short space completely inside everything, the tempered distributions outside, but I would even like to concentrate on this triple. So it's called a zero L2, a zero prime. And just to give you an idea, um, without uh, showing further pictures, uh, this is the, the kind of the, um, prototypical banach gelfan triple is little L2, to and L infinity. So you can say there are actually there are Wilson bases which map uh, the triple S0, L2, S0 prime into L1, L2, L infinity. And you see exactly what the situation is. L1 is dense in L2. L2 has a closure which is C0. So you are not, you should not think of the outer being norm dense, but only weak star dense. Weak star convergence in L infinity is just Converge, uh, po uh, coordinate wise convergence. So, of course, constant one is the limit of plateau functions, which are just bigger and bigger. Uh, I will give the uh, references only so that when anybody wants to download the file or get it from Alexa, can can take a look at this. Um, uh, now I'm coming to the connections to time frequency analysis. So. Uh, Time frequency analysis is, can be defined or described as the part of 
analysis which is using the time shift and the frequency shift. And the frequency shift is just what musicians call transposition. So you play the same tone in a different uh, frequency band, or you're doing a shift on the Fourier transform side. Or if you go back in the mathematical description, you're multiplying with a pure frequency in a complex domain, it's e to the two pi i omega, omega is the frequency t. And uh, then from this, you can uh, define the short time Fourier transform. So it's a pairing in the L2 sense from the beginning, but later on for temper distributions, if the G is a test function, and we would like to take G to be the Gauss function as, a, as to give you an idea. So you're testing your signal, maybe your musical signal, against the time frequency shifted copies of the Gauss functions, which more or less tells you, you would like to know at every given moment in time, what is the frequency content. And uh, for illustrations, people uh, very often use musical score, where you want to know which kind of melody is played at which time, at, in the, which moment of time. I could show you real time of a slide, um, demonstration, but it would take time and maybe I would not be able to come back. Mathematically speaking, a time frequency shift is going from a Gauss function to something which is modulated uh, in, and, and shifted around. And modulation is, of course, imposing a frequency. And um, so then we can already define a zero. A zero is the space of all square integrable functions. So you start inside the Hilbert space, which have an integrable short time Fourier transform. We call it VG. So that's the short time Fourier transform with localizing window G of the function F. Uh, one should know that uh, maybe I shall talk in a moment that this um, short time Fourier transform for a normalized window is an isometry. So the total energy of the signal, which is usually spread in time. So you would say it's loud for a moment, and this is a big loud signal, and the other is a not so loud signal. The L2 norm, the energy in the signal F, the L2 norm is the same as the L2 norm over the plane. So you are distributing the energy in the time frequency plane or in phase space. Uh, so also it's clear from Schwarz that the short time Fourier transform is a bounded function. So we're talking about spectrograms of L2 functions as bounded square integrable functions. But we all know that a function can be square integrable without it being integrable because it may be decaying a little bit too slow and only by squaring it, it goes to zero. So this is really a significant condition and we and get a norm uh, on this. I didn't uh, have it on this slide. By taking the L1 norm of this VGF. Um, from this description, we can very easily get uh, uh, two basic properties of a zero. Pi u eta is just applying a time frequency shift. So what is the L1 norm of such a spectrogram if you do a time shift? Well, you have this function shifted in time. What if you do a frequency shift? Well, there are phase factors, but they're also only of absolute value one. So you see the same picture at a different position, which of course means that you have the same L1 norm. So it's a norm which is time frequency invariant. And a zero was more or less discovered as the minimal Banach space, which is inside all of the LP spaces, having this property number one. On the other hand, if you take a spectrogram with a Gauss window, and we all know that the Gauss function is uh, fully invariant if you normalize it properly, then the uh, full transform is just a rotate, rotation of the spectrogram. So uh, what is the spectrogram of a pure frequency? Of course, it's a line at the height of frequency omega zero. And what is the full transform in a distributional setting of a pure frequency, it's a Dirac. And the spectrogram of a Dirac is, of course, a vertical line at the position of the time where it occurs. So you can see this is not only for uh, Dirac's and pure frequencies, but it's also true for in, in the general setting. So rotation is something that leaves L1 norms invariant. Therefore, we have a Banach space, uh, which has this uh, nice invariance property. And uh, because, uh, yeah, okay. 
Um, yeah, maybe because you have a minimality property, you also get algebra property. So you get a nice Banach algebra, and locally it's like the Fourier algebra. So everything which is um, uh, obtained as a convolution square, so L2 is L2 will be in this space if it says compact support. So trapezoidal functions and so on, other things are in this space. Actually, for experts in summability, you can name any classical summability kernel used in full analysis, and you will find that it's in this space. Uh, this is work done by Ferenc Weiss from Budapest, who has explained this. Okay, here you have uh, this uh, Moyal formula, and uh, what I want to do is to explain a little bit how to use these spaces um, in, in classical theory. Um, I think I have not taken a slide for the dual space, so maybe I should tell you that from this reconstruction formula, so you can reconstruct the function f from the short time Fourier transform by using as much of the building block, which is this time frequency shifted Gauss function, as you have um, uh, as you found in the analysis step. So in a formal way, this formula should remain remind you of the classical Fourier analysis formula. You have the inver Fourier inversion formula, which says F can be reconstructed. Here, instead of the pi lambda G, you would have the pure frequencies. And then the question is, how much of a given pure frequency should you use? And the answer is, well, take the Fourier transform, which is the scalar product between the original function and F. There's, a, however, a very significant difference to the classical Fourier transform because here, the building blocks are localized functions. So building blocks are in L2, and the convergence is a much better way. Whereas in the full transform way, you would say the building blocks are pure frequencies. Finite remanent sums are trigon. Oh, Can you still see me? I mean, the, the slides? No, no. We don't, just, we don't see I slides. Don't know if... We don't see slides. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it seems to just come back always without my interact. When when the net is is interrupted, okay. it seems it, now it's, yeah yes it, yeah. yes it seems that yes. I have to uh, restart the connection of my slides. Now you should see the formula. Reconstruction formula, yes. We see the screen. Now in L2, and you can even write Riemannian. Uh, and this is more or less the idea of Gabor analysis. You can even take, uh, if you are kind of smart enough to do the right extra measures, It's not that you have some really nasty reconstruction formula, but uh, you can reconstruct uh, from discrete versions of this formula. But uh, this is not the main point. Uh, my main point I wanted to say is To describe it as those tempered distributions which have a bounded spectrogram. And what is weak star approximation? This is just uniform convergence over spectrogram level over compact domains. So, so my, my put weak star uh, compact disk. You're buying maybe three minutes of a song and you're buying all the information that you have from zero to 20 kilohertz because nobody can hear ultrasound. I mean, human beings cannot hear the ultrasound. From the point of view of analysis, 
you're just limiting everything in time to three minutes and in frequency to 20 kilohertz. So you have uh, not a uniform approximation of the sound signal, but only over this relatively large rectangular domain. And so Wigstar approximation is actually a quite natural concept, very similar to the approximation that you have when you approximate a continuous image from your analog camera by a high resolution pixel camera. So it's the point is you'd have to do finite dimensional approximations and, and this is what you can do. Now I will jump and not uh, talk about the history. Just this is the notation, I mean the normalization of the short time of the Fourier transform that I'm using with the two pi and the inversion formula. We also know that the natural assumption seems to be integrability, but a zero is a space of Riemann integrable functions. Since the Fourier transform is again uh, in a zero, it's also Riemann integrable. So you can say for a zero, you have this pair of reconstruction formulas without Lebesgue integration. And of course, you can prove Plauschel's theorem from there using density arguments without a Lebesgue integration theory. The next thing is, of course, to recall convolution. You can do it by pointwise multiplication, but I have another way to do it just um, by relating it to the composition of operators, but I have to skip this here. Unfortunately, I discovered a little bit too late um, that uh, the last line is not readable, so I will read it to approach to convolution for bounded measures without using measure theory is to say, well, bounded measures are linear functionals on C0. So that's just to say functional analysis is very helpful. And engineers talk about BIBO system, bounded input, bounded output systems, as linear operators which map C0 into C0. So C0 are the bounded continuous functions vanishing at infinity. So it's the closure of a zero or the short space with respect to the supernorm. And um, then you can show that each such um, uh, operator is a convolution with a bounded measure where of course a functional is convolved with a test function by taking the test function, flipping it, so reflecting it at the origin and applying it to a shifted version. So. This is a basic criterion and I will wanted to put it here because if you're asking what are the linear operators from the smallest space as zero in this family to the largest, which is a zero prime, then you can play the same game if you first verify, and that's not very difficult once you have the, some basic properties of a zero, that every linear operator which maps a zero into the dual space as zero prime actually due to the properties, intrinsic properties of a zero will map a zero into the bounded continuous functions. So you can then apply the formula in the last game and you get a linear functional. So you can say, well, all I have to know is what the output is at the level zero. That gives you an opportunity to find that this operator is a moving average and in order to get to the conventions with convolution, you have to introduce the flip operator. But it's clear that the composition of two moving average operators is another moving average operator. And that's how you can introduce convolution of bounded measures and so on. Uh, from there, I have an easy way, again, avoiding or not using measure theory to prove the uh, convolution theorem, which is a very important a step for engineering courses. They start to discuss these BIBO systems and then they want to show that mu zero is the impulse response for what they call the linear system, the linear translation invariant system. And they want to show that it has a transfer function and the transfer function is just the Fourier transform of the measure. But uh, I have mentioned and I'm jumping back a few slides that a zero is invariant under the, the Fourier transform, so the red formula, and uh, because I'm not completely sure that I have the formula ready here, I would tell you, as in the same case as in the Schwartz case, you can define the Fourier transform on the dual space. Either you prove 
that, of course, you say, I know tempered distributions theory, I know what the Fourier transform of an element inside the tempered distributions is. And then you are saying, well, if I rotate the spectrogram, which is bounded, it's clear it will stay bounded. If you say, I don't want to use this theory, you can say, well, I define the Fourier transform of a tempered distribution sigma hat by saying what it's doing on the test function. And of course, you are saying sigma hat of f should be sigma of f hat, just the standard rule. And then you are verifying that this is a good rule, and then you can describe the properties, and so you can define without reference to tempered distributions what the Fourier transform is. So this is uh, what I wanted to say about these tempered distributions. And I was mentioning that a zero is the smallest representative in the space of families. Do you still see me? I mean, the, the slides. Uh, yeah, we, we see this, the slide. Is the usual approach to well, your analysis. Yes. Yeah, OK. Um, and so I can. Uh, uh, so, come to the. I want, wanted to say that you can have the Fourier transform extended to a zero prime. Now, the next step will be uh, the formal definition of what a Bandakel from triple is. It's actually a category. So, it's not only that we have new objects, which are triples of the Banach space embedded densely into Hilbert space and so on, but we have also morphisms. So if you have two such banach gelfand triple, it's very plausible what a morphism should be. It's a structure-preserving mapping. It should map the small guy into the small guy. The, in the unitary case, the Hilbert space into the Hilbert space in a unitary way, and it should extend in a weak star, unique way to the dual spaces. Um, here is a short slide saying, this is not really new. People know about this. When they talk about, look at the very last line, about the algebra of absolutely continuous Fourier series. This is what Wiener introduced. Kind of you're saying, well, the problem of pointwise convergence is nasty, but if we take absolutely convergence things, it's, it's fine. But then you look at the dual of the algebra and you call them pseudo measures because it's slightly larger than the measures. And with distribution theory, you have a perfect Banach Gelfand triple isomorphism. So it's just you can look at this at all the three levels. And A, L2 pseudo measures is mapped into L1, L2, L infinity. And it's continuous at three levels and weak star, weak star continuous at the outer level. So this is what a Banach Gelfand triple is. Now, uh, I would like to just mention that uh, maybe, yeah, we have other mappings like a, a regularization operators. So these are operators mapping every level to the test functions, but also other things which preserve the levels. And so that's what you do with, with some ability. You're saying, I'm a little bit leaving the space L1 uh, when I go to the Fourier transform, but when I apply some mobility methods, I get uh, functions which are locally like L1, but with better localization properties. And that's actually, you're ending up in a zero. And from a zero, you go back. But then you have to take limits until you're having exactly this situation. So I would say a zero L2, a zero prime are much better adapted to the Fourier transform compared to the back spaces. L1, L2, LP spaces. Also, we should keep in mind that LP spaces are squeezed between the little and the big space. So L2 is optimally embedded. The others are embedded in a different way. But if you give me any operator from LP to LQ, I can also always restrict it to an operator from a zero to a zero prime. And this is uh, very, very useful. We also have similar regularization properties as with tempered distributions. So take a tempered, uh, an element from a zero prime, smooth it, you get a bounded continuous functions, which is good enough locally so that if you multiply it, you get a test. Hans, some connection problems. 
Oh, I have to reconnect. We cannot hear you yeah. now. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, perfectly. Yeah, okay. okay. So, can you see now the convolution operators? So, not yet. Uh, if, if I think. Huh? Not, not yet. Ah, now it's okay. Realizers. Yeah, okay. So, you have this smoothing with test functions and then localization, or first localization, then smoothing, then you have. So this is very similar to a, a corresponding formula for the short space. Maybe I spend two minutes on this statement. The Fourier transform for me is a unitary banach gelfand triple automorphism. So we all know it's L2 to L2. In the middle, you have Plascher theorem. But instead of saying it's uh, badly with respect to L1, I would say it's nice with respect to S0. And all this mobility kernel, as I was mentioning, are in it. On the other hand, if you really want to know what the FFT is doing, it's a change of basis, you should look at this at the outer level. So at the outer level, you can say, oh, okay, pure frequencies belong to a zero prime. Dirac's belong to a zero primes. And the Fourier transform is the unique transformation which maps to frequencies in that what the musician would say. He hears a pure frequency and says, Okay, this was this pre frequency. My analysis tells me that this was frequency 440 hertz at this and this at amplitude. So I think it's a to understand the free transform. From uh, I see I have to jump here. You have some pictures of the classical summability kernels. So all these functions are in this, and uh, maybe I. I'm mentioning now this theorem for kernel theorem for translation invariant operators. So if you give me an operator from LP to LQ, any LP LQ except maybe infinity, which commutes with translations, you can look at this an operator by trivial restriction to a zero and trivial extension to a zero prime as an operator which maps a zero into a zero prime. And then you have this theorem then, is it, do you still see the fast slides? Yes, the Fourier transform. Yeah, okay. okay. Because it's, uh, sometimes I hear some noise and I'm not sure if it's bad connection. So you can write up to this flip operator, the operator as just some moving average applied to the flipped function. Or you can also say, I'm moving the Tx over the function and uh, apply it to the test function. So every such operator is a moving uh, moving uh, moving average yeah now uh, since time is running I would like to jump uh, um, uh, to here here you have the formula for the short term free transform I'm jumping to the uh, kernel theorem uh, and just a moment. Yeah. Uh, the kernel uh, that you may know from the theory of Schwartz is an attempt to say continuous variable linear operator has a matrix representation. That one has to be very careful because if you try to replace the two dimensional discrete matrix by two dimensional function, then you difficulty to even represent the identity operator. You would say the identity operator is the collection of Dirac measures on the diagonal. Already uh, you have to introduce uh, distribution. We have this situation that the correct formulation is the following. The operator from Schwartz to temple distributions is test functions to distributions, which you can describe only by applying them again to a test function. And dimensional version of a, of a kernel is then a distribution of two variables applied to these elementary test functions, which is a product f of x times g of y. So this is the correct way of describing 
the kernel theorem in the template distribution set. And of course, you can say, well, if this operator extends to an operator from S0 and is having a target in S0 prime, can you use this kernel theorem? But I find it more interesting that you can do it without Schwartz kernel theorem. So without a theory of nuclear Frechy spaces, just using Banach spaces. So the natural expectation here is that you have a kernel operator, which is a continuous function of two variables, and this is what you would call an integral operator. Now, in my world of S0 and so on, a good kernel is an operator in S0 of two variables, and we have a tensor product property, so you can write, and actually it's going back to the original idea of Fourier. Why was Fourier so successful? Because he was achieving a separation of variables using the exponential functions. And this is the property that is going into a zero. So you can write a zero of R2D as a tensor product, as a projective tensor product of variables of a zero of each variable. So you have elementary tensors and you take absolutely convergent sums of elementary tensors from a zero and you get a zero of two variables. So if this is a very decent function, then you can uh, really get very nice operators. And these are regularizing operators. So are good operators where you map uh, distributions into test functions. The kernel theorem is usually known and explained in functional analysis courses at the Hilbert space level, where we have the Hilbert space of Hilbert Schmidt operators with this fancy color product. This color product with two Hilbert Schmidt operators is a nuclear operator, a tracer class operator. So the trace of T composed with S star is this color product of an operator T with S. But uh, uh, this is just uh, an extension, it's kind of the plot rel version of what I have. And the most general operators are going from the there's most of the big ones, and they correspond to distributions in the big space. So um, maybe just one remark. If you want to know what is the matrix representing a given linear operator, you would apply the matrix to a column of, to a unit operator. So you would say a width column choosing k equal 5, k of a, e number 5 is the fifth column. And Corresponds third coordinate, well, you apply it to your. When you do such a thing, you know how to explain it to the continuous setting. So you expect that such a formula might be true. Apply the operator t to a direct map. This is hopefully a continuous function and evaluate it at x. And so this is the exact perfect analog, and this is really valid for good operators. Whereas uh, here is you have the tensor product property, and so we have the kernel theorem now in the setting of a zero prime. A bounded linear operator from the small space S zero to the biggest space S zero prime has a unique kernel K, which is an object of two variables. So the little K is the kernel, which describes the operator capital K in the same way as you have it in the in the uh, Schwartz theorem. And you can do a lot of things, uh, and uh, I don't go into the details now, but this is the uh, natural extension to the of the Hilbert-Schmidt kernel theorem that you have. Uh, in short ways, you can say, well, we have a Banach-Gelfand triple of operators. It's the Hilbert-Schmidt operators with the standard linear product. It's the regularizing operators described as operators going from S0 to S0 prime, and it's all the operators here. Now, I was mentioning that S0 is via Wilson basis isomorphic to little L1, and therefore a zero prime is isomorphic to L infinity. So what would be the analog if you take the sequence spaces? And for a moment, I was shocked in a way that I said, well, maybe it's trivial for this. So what are the operators from L1 to L infinity? And then clearly, they are the bounded matrices. So L1 goes to L infinity means each column is a, an L bounded sequence. 
And if you have now a bounded sequence of columns in the infinity sense, you have a bounded matrix. So uh, the opposite, the inner case is somebody is giving you an operator from L infinity to, to L1. And then you will say, oh, yes, I can play the same game, but there is a big problem. You can know what the operator is doing on the unit vectors, but uh, you don't know what the lin what is doing on the um, outside the linear span, closed linear span of the unit vector. So that's C0. So by hand Banach, of course, there are nasty operators which map C0 to 0, but which are not the 0 operators. And that's where you have to understand that you are not allowed to take all the linear or bounded operators in the norm sense, but you have to take the ones which take the weak star topology to a zero. And then you are have to get rid of this uh, nasty problem. And so uh, the correct statement is, the first uh, part is, you should look at the operators which are mapping L infinity to L1, but in a weak star to a norm stable way. And of course, in practice, this means if you go back, that these are the operators which have a matrix represent. Han Banner tells us nobody has seen them, but there must exist uh, due to um, the axiom of choice. There must be some operators which are pathological, where you cannot reconstruct them by their action on the unit vectors, so they will not have the matrix representation and I would say at least from a practical point they are not the important points so engineers are not so much interested in these orders and in the mathematical statement you have to just take the correct uh, setting. Any other ways to, to work with these representations and I just want to mention uh, one statement which is uh, explained uh, it's the so-called spreading representation in a linear algebra way you would say well I have n cyclic shift operators. I have n cyclic um, modulation operators. So I can multiply with the columns of the Fourier matrix. So altogether in my n squared dimensional algebra of operators of matrices n by n, I find n squared time frequency shift operators. So the question is, maybe they are linear independent. And yes, if you take the standard Euclidean structure of C n squared, you find out that yes, they form an orthonormal system. So every matrix can be written in a unique way as a superposition of time frequency shift operators. And if you try to put everything uh, in the continuous domain, you have to be very careful. Uh, but if an operator is written as a superposition out in the last line, H lambda, pi lambda, D lambda, with H in a zero, then you have very nice operators, which are the good operators. You can extend this to find out, yes, L2 functions give you Hilbert-Schmidt operators, but even an arbitrary operator from a zero to a zero prime can be written, and the corresponding symbol that you have to define in a suitable way by extension from the elementary one is um, called the spreading representation. And then you have things like an operator is commuting with time frequency shift if and only if it's fully, no, it's a spreading representation is concentrated on the lattice, which is quite the analog of the function space theory. The function is periodic if and only if it's fully it's concentrated on the orthogonal lattice and so on. So a lot of things where usually people fight a lot with integrals uh, can be explained and work. Out with such a representation to come to an end uh, and thank you uh, for the um, uh, attention uh, so our, I mean just the slides of course are five references and so on uh, and uh, so discussions. I hope it's a good time. I still have a lot of material if you want. Okay. okay. So Alexei, do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Hans.
Thank you, Hans, very much for a very, very nice talk. Uh, and we have a lot of people, maybe maybe some people may ask questions. Want to, you just, uh, guys, you just, if you want to ask questions, just raise a hand, okay? Please, yeah. Okay. I just want to mention that, of course, people can send me a short email due to the, I mean, I was leaving my room, which has even worse connection, but yeah. Yeah, we will we, we, we'll have presentation on our web page. We also record a video we will put in on your tube. And we also can send the presentation or video to anyone who is interested to get this presentation and, vid and, and video. So, well, yeah. questions. We have one question from one student, maybe. Yuri. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Feichtinger, for a very interesting talk. Um, you have used uh, the notation of RD with a head. Is it a, a compactification or so I'm something? Waiting for questions. I can't hear you. I cannot hear you, Hans. Hello, hello. Do you yeah, now, now it's okay. Again? Yeah, there was an interruption, yeah. Yes. So, Yuri, can you repeat your question? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, Professor Feichtinger, thank you for your very interesting talk. I would like to uh, pay attention to the notation of RD with a hat. Is it or a, a compactification of the metric space RD or something oh. else? Okay, thank you very much. I didn't think of this. Uh, RD hat is the what I call what engineers call the frequency domain. So uh, we think of the Fourier transform mapping L1 of RD into um, uh, bounded continuous functions again on. RD. Uh, but uh, very often we use, I don't know, Greek letters or so. So this RT hat is just uh, the, the frequency variable. So it's another copy of RD, but with a different interpretation. So I mean, in, in this period, it's like you're talking RD. Is it row or column vectors? No, it's not exactly the same. But um, if you take this as uh, just another copy, it's the frequency that you have. So in one variable, it would be just the parameter S. Thank you, thank you very much. And so, yeah, so, so, and also the, 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 I can tell you, the short time free transform is a function of two variables. Maybe I use the time, uh, or I'm, sh I'm showing you another screen, if I can do so. Uh, I'm sharing another screen, just showing you a spectrogram. So I was uh, whistling some melodies, or like da 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 da, and then you see such a spectrogram. And here, uh, it's like a score, uh, and I could do it in live and 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 online, but uh, it's too dangerous with this bad connection. So here you have time as in musical score, and you have the frequency axis. And uh, then clearly a pure frequency would be a flute playing a tone. Uh, if you would play a saxophone or any other um, uh, instrument which has a root or an organ even more, you would see a lot of parallel lines because you have a pattern of frequencies. So if you cut through the short time free transform in the vertical way, you have the spectrogram or the frequency distribution at a given time. So it would tell you more about the instrument or the speaker or the accord which is played at a given moment. Whereas if you follow a line, you would see whether that particular tone or this key has been hit by the piano at some moment and then it is another one is hit. So it's, it, but musical score is a very good example for short time free transform. And uh, maybe I mentioned that you can recognize a Schwartz function by its decay in both time and frequency. 
So within S0, you have the short space, and it's just the space of all L2 functions or S0 functions, which decay in both directions like a polynomial, like one plus the inverse of one plus x squared plus omega squared to, or s squared to some exponent for every exponent. And a tempered distribution, of course, has the opposite behavior. It has a spectrogram which is allowed to grow like a polynomial of some fixed order. So uh, you can imagine that just integrability and boundedness are much easier in a way because you have only one norm and not a family of semi-norms. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So please, more questions. Uh, uh, may I ask uh, something, uh, Alexei? Of course, uh, go ahead, please. Uh, so my question is, um, is uh, this uh, following. Uh, there is uh, some uh, pseudo differential theory which based on the time frequency, uh, time frequency transformation of Fourier or the sum Fourier integral theory and uh, something uh, like that. Uh, yes and no. I would say uh, at first sight no because one of the, the, the one of the more original motivation uh, for introducing this space I was uh, so this was about 40 years ago that I was proposing this space without knowing how useful it would be uh, was to do Schwartz theory on locally compact abelian groups. So if you have no Lie group structure on such a abelian group, and I'm following the tradition of Andre Weil, this is this is the right setting for full analysis you may have difficulties to define differentiability and smoothness in the usual way. On the other hand, uh, if you look up the development of uh, differential operators, partial differential operators, partial differential operators with variable uh, coefficients, you come up to the theory of pseudo differential operators. And then time frequency analysis seems to be a very useful tool to describe pseudo differential operators. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, this classical constant coefficient PDE stuff cannot uh, be particularly well be described in such a setting, but you can imagine that for, um, I mean, why is a zero in my notation called also M1? Because there are a lot of other spaces. So I have introduced also a while ago so-called modulation spaces uh, and, and with the parameters SPQ, to make them most similar to Biesov spaces. So MSPQ spaces have the special case with S equal zero, P equal Q equal one, then you have M11, which is M1. But you can take the short-term free transform, put weights in, in one or the other direction, and then you get Sobolev spaces, or if you take radial symmetric weights, which are uh, kind of more natural from a point of view of symmetry, you get Shubin classes which again have to do with the harmonic oscillator. And uh, so time frequency analysis allows to connect you with hermit expansions. And I've seen Professor Tangavelo is li listening to the talk, so he would be an expert on this connection, yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. Okay, S some, some participants cannot use microphone, so if you cannot use okay, yeah. your, your if you if some of you cannot use microphone uh, but want to ask questions please write and chat and i will um, i will read these questions yeah i'm not, not sure if, if everybody can write into the chat but yeah yeah but still they can write to my email or whatever yeah yeah no no yeah. but or yeah again but maybe you I can write a short email to me yes please yeah yeah Yes, maybe I have one uh, general question. When when studying Fourier analysis, people sometimes study separately discrete Fourier analysis and continuous Fourier analysis. Well, in your situation, yeah. is there are some particulars in sense of discrete uh, situation? Yeah, well, I have two answers. One is. Uh, you can do this theory for any locally compact abelian group. So you can repeat the story of separating. Uh, the zero prime is of the real line. 
example, for example, is large enough to contain any discrete function. And when you are talking about the standard way of proving results about the continuous Fourier transform is to say, oh, we let the period go to infinity. And that's easily so the, in this sense, this Fourier transform period was just really in the zero picture. You look at this and when you for example, you would like to compute, um, uh, you give me a continuous function, actually, if you give me a function is zero, which is if we transform, so you get finitely many samples from a regular grid, but only over finite into then what we can say is that the FFT on this put back into the continuous domain by a piecewise linear interpolation is giving you a good as zero approximation. To a describe it, you work, but these copies that are obtained by periodization, they're not visible anymore. And in frequency domain, sampling means you're periodizing in the frequency domain. So you will see these uh, co infinitely many copies disappearing to infinity. So to the observer who is seeing only a fine rectangle, everything looks quite perfect. So the answer is more, um, it's uh, a in the distributional setting, even in the zero prime setting, you can get both discrete and um, periodic and in particular finite meaning periodic and discrete inside the domain and you can approximate in the weak star sense one by the other. And as I said, um, sampling more and more densely is of course going to the continuous limit, pushing periods to infinity is going from periodic to non-periodic and all this is well explained and, and uh, done in the, in the uh, series. Okay. Okay. Can, can you hear me now, Hans? Yes. Yes. I, 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 I was a short interruption. I hope you could hear my explanations at least roughly. Yes. Yes. Um, but now you're demonstrating the screen, yeah, right? Okay. So maybe I should say over this this part of the explanation is 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 done now. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, uh, thank you. Yes, I understand that you're doing just uh, really general theory, so just taking a special measure, you can go to discrete case, or you can go to continuous case. But also, when you study discrete case, you can connect, you connect, you can connect your research with other things like holomorphic functions, like yeah. if you study so kind of the, 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 the most, imp the most imp yeah. So the most important statement maybe is that a zero is continue consists of. Um, of uh, Riemann integrable uh, continuous functions, and therefore things like a Dirac comb is in the dual space. So we all know that you can prove Poisson's formula uh, for Schwartz functions. So, uh, but this is also valid in the zero setting. So uh, there are papers in the early stage of this theory saying that, well, uh, kind of I joke usually and say Poisson's formula is not always true, meaning. You can have a function where both sides of Poisson's formula are, are finite and absolutely convergent, but they are not equal. Why? Because you can fabricate functions which after periodizations have a Fourier expansion, but not at the value zero. But if you are in a zero, it's such a nice space that everything is fine. You get a periodization which has an absolutely convergent Fourier series and therefore nothing can happen. And so in this way, all the things that people are doing with Dirac comps, sampling on time side corresponds to questions from vice versa. Uh, it's all working fine. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, guys. More questions, please. You must welcome. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe one last statement from my side. Is I, I'm, I have been teaching courses for engineers and I will hopefully do another course in October to December at ETH Zurich. 
and I'm um, on the way to prepare lecture notes, which I can share anytime people are interested to take a look, because I would like to avoid typos or inconsistencies. Uh, but that would be an approach to harmonic analysis from scratch, avoiding Lebesgue integration, measure theory, and topological vector spaces. Just pure function, linear functional analysis, Banach spaces, dual Banach spaces, and a little bit of Hilbert space theory. So you, you plan to teach in October, right? Yeah, yeah, and I'm not sure. At the moment, it's not clear whether this this course will be uh, actually a physical presence course. It's more likely that they will not allow me to to enter the lecture rooms. So it, I, I mean, I will keep you updated. Maybe one can do it as a, a public lecture. Um, it depends on ETH and and the technicalities and so on. Yeah, and thank you, thank you. Okay, please more questions. Maybe because I see now some spectrograms uh, which look like Windows Media Play. What you, I mean, I don't know if everybody is seeing this, but uh, this yellow thing that I have now see on the screen. Um, if you start the Windows Media Player, then you see the spectrogram or the short term Fourier transform as a function of time. So at each moment, you see the frequency distribution and you can also. Uh, see the pattern dis described by the by the instrument. Okay, okay, I see someone is. Let me see. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I apologize if my question is uh, seems like a, an awkward one, but have you ever um, tried to use this theory for signal synth synthesis? Uh, yes, yes, and no. There, there are. Uh, I mean, the idea was the. I mean, I have not not in a way that I can. Um, uh, demonstrated or so. But the idea was, of course, to think of graphical notation. So if you see line, then you probably would like to hear something like <laughs> So, um, and what I thought uh, to do it uh, with this integral representation, so to insert something, and then the, you find out it's not like painting, uh, because there are face factors. And if you do a simple synthesis of Gaussians put at the right along the line or so, then you very quickly find out that the frequency cancellation. So nearby frequencies with different phases kill each other. So you have to be more careful, but there is a way of doing it so that you could give me a picture with the line structure and you could make a sound out of it. Um, uh, I cannot give you a good references, but I also should mention there is a tool on the internet which I forgot and finding me now. A tool which is called the Gaborator. The Gaborator is related to the Gabor uh, expansion, which is the discrete version of what I was showing to you. And uh, in this Gaborator.com, you can upload your WAF file, so you can produce your music, and you can see what spectrogram you get from your piece of music. So you don't have to rely on, on a prefabricated music, but you can upload your own music uh, and see. That's, so I think both sides are well represented, but the synthesis part is much less. But I think it's an interesting part. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, OK, thank you. Okay. okay. Maybe my co-worker Monica Dörfel in Vienna might know better about the synthesis part. She is both a qualified musician, keyboard, uh, piano, jazz musician, and, and a, a trained um, a mathematician. So she's uh, having supervising PhD students who work in musicology and uh, time frequency analysis. So that's across uh, the boundaries. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, uh, if someone wants to make question, 
to raise a question, please raise a hand. Or... Well, as I said, not uh, not every participant allowed to use microphone, so maybe they will write questions in emails. As I said, we also have a presentation on our website of Mathematical Center, and we will be happy to share this presentation. And we also will have this video uploaded to YouTube YouTube channel. Well, it was very very nice presentation with many pictures and voices, Hans. And uh, well, thank you, thank you very much. I I hope we can turn on our microphone and thank Hans. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.